be an important one to me. And uh, then we'll, I, I'll be looking forward to introducing other presenters. So uh, most of my uh, career uh, has been devoted to studying a place called Tal Hispan in Jordan, an anthropological archaeologist. And so I'm interested in, the, in, in reconstructing cultural production and cultural change and the drivers of change over time. So this is a site that spans three millennia. And uh, here we are with another, uh, maybe, yeah, let me open up the full slideshow here. So uh, here's uh, more precisely the location. Uh, you see here the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea and the city of Jerusalem. And Hespan is located right here. And this is what it looks like today. It's an excavation site that, uh, as I say, spanned three and over three millennia. And um, <clears throat> most of my initial work was in doing what we call full analysis, studying of animal remains from the archaeological site, which, as you can tell already, is a window on the human environment interaction. So my early focus both through doing a work with animal bones and ethnography in the village was to study the food system. And of course, as you study the food system, you begin to ask what is it that causes it to change and to have different uh, patterns and, and not only the food system, but the entire site. And it turns out that Hespan is actually a, a place where there have been a whole sequence of ancient em empires that have marched through and left their footprints and each one has created a different kind of a cultural uh, complex in the site, which I've been in the process of studying. Now, the interesting thing about this is, is that you have these elite imperial projects marching through. You have local people living underneath, and they have to, their survival has depended a great deal on resilience, being able to move in and out of tents, caves, and into stone houses and back again, depending on the circumstance. So of resilience has become very interesting to me as I've been studying Hespan. And this is a brief summary of what uh, the pattern of boom and bust in uh, buildup of the food system in Hespan and also settlements. So you see some periods like the Iron II and uh, the Roman Byzantine and the Mamluk are periods of great intensification of agriculture. And then you have these, you have these bust periods where people return to very more uh, uh, self-reliant forms of livelihoods. And throughout this, we have the three, the three millennia, we have sort of an era of tribal kingdoms, that an era of cities, the Decapolis era of the Roman period, an Islamic area, and then comes the great acceleration, which changes everything. And that's how I got, uh, it's a major driver of change, particularly in the last uh, 150 years. And so that's how I came to the topic of the great acceleration. I have this interest in the long-term patterns of change, and uh, never before have we seen anything like the changes that are being brought by the great acceleration. So these, of course, are the well-known great acceleration charts that depict the ways in which um, a, uh, about a dozen uh, socioeconomic changes then impact earth system processes. And we will hear more about that. So really, with having said that, uh, the, the, the Great Acceleration, of course, has led us to the Anthropocene, which is this, this new era in which uh, the hu humans themselves have become the greatest force for change in the environment and in Earth processes. And uh, it's easy to come to the conclusion that Mother Earth is very sick. There she is in this cartoon, struggling to survive this onslaught of human uh, activity. And so that has raised a number of three key questions or issues that I'm hoping that we can discuss further in our discussion section and that will be addressed also in, in, in the presentations now to come. The first is the question of the agency role of humans as a force in changing urses and processes. Uh, for most of us in the sciences and social sciences, we, we would acknowledge that that is the case. But 
it is not exactly something that everybody <laughs> is ready to embrace at this point. And so there's a challenge of, first of all, creating awareness and communicating the fact that yes, we as humans are impacting the planet, uh, Earth system processes. The second issue is, okay, so if we are impacting the planet, what can I do as an individual? Or what can we do as local communities? Can we really make a difference? Or shall we simply say this is something we can't do anything about? So the idea of local agency, individual agency, uh, is a second theme. And the third one, of course, comes right to us. What can we as NGS explorers do from our different disciplines to engage this very current issue? As I said, it's an issue that fits with, the, with this very day, which is the first day of Earth Day. And tomorrow fits with the fact that the, there's going to be a, another um, summit of 40 nations to talk about the climate. And uh, one of the reasons, too, for addressing the issue of the Great Acceleration is it, I think, provides a much broader picture for understanding the challenge of um, climate change. And with that, I'm now delighted to be able to introduce um, a, a colleague from uh, you, uh, the um, Stockholm Resilience Center and, Glo and the Global Resilience Partnership, Albert Nordstrom. How we met is that I, I have been aware of the Stockholm Resilience Center because of my own research, but hadn't really had many contacts until this opportunity to organize this seminar. And I thought it'd be nice to hear from someone who has been directly involved in studying the Great Acceleration and the Anthropocene. And with that, uh, Albert, I turn the time over to you now, and I'll stop sharing screens. So uh, we look forward to hearing from you uh, about um, the research and uh, your work in edu education in this area. Thank you, Oyston. Thanks for inviting me to this. Um, we're a small little tight group here, but hopefully I can pique your interest the part over the next 25 minutes and then hand it over to Jonathan. I know everyone's suffering from Zoom fatigue nowadays, but we'll make it as exciting as possible, right? So I hope everyone can see. Yeah, we can see your screen. Great. So I entitled this, this book, Navigating the Anthropocene, and that basically comes from how I view the Anthropocene and how many of my colleagues view it as a dynamic process. It's not set in stone, so there's still kind of possibility to wiggle our way through the Anthropocene um, in ways which aren't going to be completely negative. Often the Anthropocene is, you know, envisioned as something really, really bad, right? Um, as Oisten said, I'm from the Stockholm Resilience Center. Um, I also work as the head of knowledge and evidence at the Global Resilience Partnership. And if you wanna follow me on Twitter, just follow that handle there um, and you'll get a sense of the multiple different strands of research that I'm involved in. But let's, let's jump in and how I'll structure this, I'll be focusing on the great acceleration, but I'll also you know, try and make a bit of a broader sweep around that. So I'll start off with giving uh, my take on some of the defining features of the Anthropocene with acceleration, of course, as a central element of this, of this epoch. But then also speak a bit about the, the potential for agency that not all is lost. The Anthropocene doesn't have to be bad. It can actually hopefully turn into a good Anthropocene. And then I'll try and wrap up with uh, touching on the final point that Oyston raised is what kind of science do we then need in order to kind of help push, navigate our, our way through the turbulent choppy waters of the Anthropocene towards a good Anthropocene. So, I mean, the term comes from the Greek word anthropos um, and, and epoch, which is the, the epoch of humanity, basically. And that's what Anthropocene means. It, it implies that humanity now is the driving force, not just, you know, having a big footprint on terrestrial and marine ecosystems, but actually defining how the Earth system itself works, how the cogs and the machinery of this big complex thing is actually chugging along, humanity being the dominant force within that. Um, the term was, was coined by Paul Crutzen. Um, legend has it that he's sitting in a meeting in Mexico, Earth system scientists were kind of arguing with each other what, what to term the, this 
this human dominated age that they found themselves witnessing and 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 observing and Paul Crutzen just you know hit his hand on the on the table and shouted that it's the Anthropocene god damn it I don't know if that's true I wasn't there but it sounds nice and bombastic so we'll stick with that story um and if we try and place the Anthropocene within, you know, broader geological change, we still have a bit of a question mark here as to when it really starts. Is debate backwards and forwards? Is it, you know, officially an epoch? For me, I'm 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 not into that discussion that much. For me, it's a conceptual um, framing, more or less, um, to try and understand and place humanity within the dynamics of the Earth system. Um, But if I would kind of, you know, narrow it down to a few keywords, like if you ask me, what are the keywords of the Anthropocene? It would be difficult. I gave it a stab. I would say it's novel, you know, extremely novel. It's accelerating. It's unequal, hyper-connected, and turbulent. And let's try and unpack those buzzwords very, very quickly, one by one, as we move through this lecture. Novelty in the Anthropocene can be envisioned in many different ways. Um, but one way of, of looking at this, just you know, for example, the rate of change. Um, we've all heard you know, the notion that we're now in the sixth mass extinction. Rates of biodiversity loss are happening at unprecedented rates. Um, and if you look at you know, this figure here, really is just so striking to me. If you look at the mammal um, biomass on Earth currently, 4% are wild mammals, 60% is livestock, and 36 are humans. So it really kind of just smacks me in the face as, you know, the rate of change that's led to this, but also there's no doubt that humanity is having a massive effect on, on a bunch of things on the planet. And this is kind of, you know, um, throwing, you know, classical uh, traditional scientific disciplines off the board. A while ago, we wrote a paper in functional ecology where we argued basically that a bit uh, provocatively that um, traditional ecology is probably going to be obsolete soon. We, we threw it out there just to kind of start a bit of a discussion. We made the point, you know, traditional ecology that focused a lot on biophysical process and it's built a lot of its models and paradigms around understanding how biophysical processes can predict ecological phenomena could work in the Holocene, but in the Anthropocene, if you take this coral reef, for example, where, you know, trying to predict what's happening on a coral reef is so much more than just understanding wave energy and seawater temperature. It's all about understanding human migration and urbanization, CO2 emissions, the role of trade um, and how that affects fishing dynamics, commercial fisheries, tourism. So you're having all these bunch of interconnected human driven um, big drivers affecting ecosystems all over the world which is really a novel situation. So the point we made is, you know, for not just ecology, but for a lot of disciplines out there, we really need to start rethinking of how we try and understand this novel space, which is the Anthropocene. Do we have to revisit our paradigms? In this paper, we throw out the notion of social ecological macroecology, for example, um, just to kind of get the, the discussion going. So we're in a novel space. Um, and maybe some of you have seen this graph because that's also a nice way of visualizing, visualizing this novelty. It just, you know, it maps out um, temperature reconstructions on the top panel of the past 100,000 years. Um, Jonathan, I'm sorry if I'm stealing your slides because I'm pretty sure you're going to show a variant of this one, but uh, we might have different takes on it. Anyway, just showing temperature reconstructions over long periods of time. Um, and if you look at the top panel, you know, you see when, you know, the first migration of modern humans out of Africa occurred um, and so on and so on. And, you know, temperature was fluctuating. And then bam, we come into this lovely little cradle of civilization, which we call the Holocene, where things were quite stable. Um, because of these really nifty feedbacks within the Earth system, right? Keeping temperature within a quite nice domain, allowing agriculture to flourish the great European civilizations. And it's that kind of safe space um, or cradle that we risk thrusting ourselves out of as we go into the Anthropocene. And it's just interesting, again, in the bottom panel, this is even longer temperature reconstructions. And of course, uncertainty increases. But it's really, really sobering to see that, you know, possibly high, highly possible that over the course of three million years before present, we've never exceeded two degrees um, global temperatures, high global temperatures relative to pre-industrial. And that's what we're kind of looking at now. That's a target we've set ourselves with the, with the Paris Agreement. So really in uncharted terrains, um, I would say, as we're kind of heading into the Anthropocene. 
And there's a little discussion as to when we put the marker down, when did the Anthropocene really kick in? Um, and like I said, I'm trying to steer away from those discussions, but there's a really good case for it, you know, actually kickstarting off somewhere in the mid 20th century. And these great acceleration graphs are a really nice piece of visual evidence, but also data driven evidence behind that. So Will, Stefan and colleagues map these, um, these great acceleration graphs back um, in 2011, the first time, and then updated them in 2015. Basically, what they did is just took a bunch of Earth system trends, like carbon dioxide levels, nitrous oxide levels, the levels of stratospheric ozone, et cetera, et cetera. It's a blue chart on the left here. And they also mapped a bunch of socioeconomic trends as well, like population levels, GDP levels, et cetera, et cetera. And what they found strikingly was that across almost all of these different charts, you see a kind of exponential acceleration occurring around 1950. So they coined this term, the great acceleration, saying this is really when the, when the, uh, the impact and the, and the effect of human activities is really ramping up and thrusting us inevitably into the Anthropocene, out of the Holocene. And, you know, these great acceleration visualizations have been used and picked up by other scientists recently. Waters et al. in a really, really nice review um, that really makes a very nice case as to why the Anthropocene is actually another epoch distinct from the Holocene. So, you know, read that if you're really interested in, in kind of nerding out into the multiple strands of evidence that make a really good case to that. But they took the great acceleration graphs inspired by them and mapped out, you know, the increased use of aluminium, concrete, plastic, synthetic fibers. And look what you get, I mean, a very similar pattern. Around 1950, the onset of the great acceleration, you see how the use of these materials just kind of skyrockets up. Of course, not wanting to, to be worse than everyone else, um, a bunch of colleagues and myself, my, my ex-PhD also got inspired by this. I wanted to do the same kind of exercise on the oceans. Um, we'd also, we've been kind of dealing in discussions and conversations for some time around the kind of the, the, the blue economy, which has been pitched as a kind of a savior for many kind of, of the world's economic and social problems. You know, we're running out of resources on land. We're having difficulty filling up um, terrestrial agriculture um, or kind of Pump, pumping up yields in terrestrial agriculture. So let's kind of turn our eyes towards the ocean. And the ocean economy is a buzz term which is thrown around in policy circles and economic circles. We want to kind of see like, what does this kind of, um, the, the blue economy potentially result to in the ocean domain? Do we see similar trends in, in human appropriation, for example, that we've seen from the Great Acceleration Graph? So we mapped out a bunch of different um, claims to the oceans, you know, marine aquaculture, the use and extraction of marine genetic resources, the rise of cruise tourism, the, the use of offshore wind farms, et cetera, et cetera. And we found very similar graphs, but slightly delayed. So, you know, our argument is that the blue acceleration, it's happening um, just like the great acceleration is happening mainly on land, but with a bit of a lag time of, of 20, 30 years, which isn't such a big surprise because, uh, you know, historically we've, we've kind of exploited land resources first before really going in and, and maximizing industrial exploitation in the oceans a few decades afterwards. Um, and, you know, the Anthropocene, you know, just to kind of, again, um, talk a bit about some of the other facets of it. It's, it's unequal, I said, but it's also, I mean, it, it has led to, to some good things. We can't just paint it as something just completely negative, right? So, you know, during the Anthropocene or during the past 40, 50 years, um, there's been an increase in, in economic growth. Number of people living in extreme poverty um, has declined, although the rate of that decline um, and even as we stretch this trend line, I don't have it in the graph here, but as we stretch it out in 2020, that rate is declining and recent data is even showing that that's increasing. But generally, number of people living in extreme poverty has kind of has gone down, right, um, during this great acceleration. And if you look at Gini coefficient, you know, the higher Gini coefficient, um, higher inequality, you see it's been growing for some time, but it's actually been declining since the 1990s. So uh, again, some, some good signs, although, you know, people would argue that if you look at within country inequality, that's still quite varied. Um, and you see that for some countries, the orange bar charts, Gini inequality is decreasing. Things are getting a bit more equal, but in some other countries, it's increasing. So the Anthropocene, is it equal? Is it unequal? Well, the, the verdict's still out there, but there's a great recent report by the World, Science, World Social Science uh, Foundation, um, which actually makes the point that um, 
we really should look at more than just income and wealth when thinking about inequalities. So we should think about, you know, knowledge inequalities, political inequalities. And the point they make in that report is that those kind of inequalities have actually been increasing in the Anthropocene. They actually use the Anthropocene as a, as a framework to understand inequalities, right? So that's a great report. So we touched upon about that, you know, um, the Anthropocene, it's novel, it's accelerating, it's probably, you know, most strands of data showing it's, it's unequal, you know, not everyone is reaping the rewards <laughs> of the Anthropocene um, in equitable ways. It's hyper-connected. So this is um, a picture just showing, you know, human settlements, roads, railways, air routes, shipping lanes, fishing um, efforts, submarine cables, and transmission lines globally in one piece. It's from a, a group called Globia. If you go on the web, you can find some stunning visualizations they've done around the Anthropocene. Really, really, really stunning. But just shows the insane amount of connectivity that we have in the current epoch that we live in. It's unprecedented. Um, and this you know, means that places around the world are connected in multiple ways, whether it's through trade or communication or migration, in ways that they've never been before. Of course, we've had, you know, the great exchange, the eras of the great, the, the kind of explorers, connectivity has always been there, but the rate at which the world is connected today um, makes us speak of this hyper connectivity, you know, do we have too much connectivity, basically? Um, why can we have too much connectivity? Well, there's a whole strand of research, again, stemming from Anthropocene and great acceleration thinking, um, talk about systemic risks and cascading risks. Basically, the point they make is that as you have highly interconnected, a highly interconnected Earth system, um, the chance of risks spreading from one sector for one country across you know across space and time in very rapid ways increases and COVID-19 is, is an example of this systemic risk right but started a small kind of um, zoonotic um, disease that spread locally in China just very quickly it basically knocked out not just health systems but economic systems social systems all over the world so this is a, a, a figure from from a colleague victor gallas a paper they published in 2011 just conceptually showing how these cross scale interactions can lead to these systemic risks so for example you have restrictions in fishing in the eu causing a bunch of eu fleets starting to fish in other places around the world um, the west coast of africa being one of these space this might cause decreasing local fish stocks and this is this has been happening so you have decreasing local fish stocks caused by these EU fleets coming in their fishing, but also because of local overfishing and land use changes in the vicinity. So you have nutrient leakage coming in, et cetera, et cetera. What does this do? Well, it forces people that usually were fishing to move in towards bushmeat hunting and increasing their kind of interactions with wildlife, um, which has led to a bunch of zoonotic diseases happening there. And then you could potentially have these regional cascades outwards. So again, you see how multiple human drivers across different scales causing rapid changes in things and then a spread of things upwards, um, which is in essence what a systemic risk is. So this is why we're worried about hyperconnectivity. Um, and turbulence, what's happening here? Well, in the, the rate of change that we're really pushing onto this earth system has caused a lot of you know, earth system scientists, both from the social sciences also coming into the, into the mix, to start worrying about these planetary boundaries. It was introduced as a term by Will Steffen. It's been nuanced by, by Johan Rockström um, um, and, and other colleagues, basically saying, you know, we can try and narrow it down. There's been some discussion around whether these are the correct boundaries or not. But basically, the earth system has a set of defining critical thresholds, boundaries, right, in some key processes, such as the integrity of the biosphere, which we can measure by the amount of diversity, living diversity within um, in the planet, the amount of land system change we can, we can carry out, the amount of fresh water we can use, et cetera, et cetera. And a bunch of these boundaries have already been crossed. Um, so when it comes to bi biosphere integrity, we spoke about the six mass extinction, you know, researchers are really having good signs um, which are quite terrible. They've already crossed that threshold. We've pushed, we've eroded so much of the world's living diversity that we've kind of gone past that threshold, which is desta destabilizing the whole Earth system. We've also kind of altered biochemical flows, the phosphorus and nitrogen cycle. Wow. Hugely altered by human appropriation and human use. And again, the risk is that we've already crossed that, that threshold. Again, in its turn, destabilizing the Earth system. 
And there's a lot of recent work, I think Jonathan's part of that work, trying to understand how these different boundaries interact with one another, because not independent of one another, right? If you, if you introduce novel entities, for example, which is a boundary you see there, which is colored in blue, we still don't really know how far we're pushing that one. But that can affect biosphere integrity. So how, how are these things really interacting? So uh, yeah, so uncertain turbulent times, you know, how much time do we have until we've kind of pushed more of these planetary boundaries and the earth system can take? Um, and that's what a lot of people are afraid of, you know, that we actually can, you know, tip the Earth system into another regime. This is, you know, the work on regime shifts has really it comes from the natural science, from the natural sciences, um, but more and more has been used by the humanities and looking at, you know, can we have regime shifts in human systems and social systems or interlinked social ecological systems? Basically, what the theory says, and there's evidence for that in local ecosystems and even local social ecological systems, is that, you know, a system, whether it's a coral reef or a, or a city, has these critical thresholds and you can push it, right? But if you push it too much, its resilience gets eroded and it flips into another state. Um, when you talk about ecosystems, you know, you can have these massive catastrophic consequences, whereas, you know, you have a, a desirable state before, before the shift that provides a lot of good ecosystem services in the form of fish or crops or whatever. And then when it shifts, um, you have altered big changes in these ecosystem services and basically you don't get a flow of services as you wish for so it's quite quite nasty stuff um the evidence we're seeing is that you know these regime shifts are happening more and more and they're happening all over the world um don't try and read the detail but basically it's from a paper by other colleagues that came a couple of years ago um looking at how these regime shifts are happening all over the world to what extent and you know you see that there's a bunch of different regime shifts happening and they're happening all over the world and recently, this has been kind of taken up to the Earth system level, you know, um, Tim Lenton and Carl Folke, Rockstrom, a bunch of others. I've been speaking of these, you know, global climate tipping points. So changes in the climate um, are having these interactions with these tipping points, like the Amazon rainforest, you know, if 20 to 40 percent of the Amazon rainforest is lost. You know, you're going to lose the rainforest dynamics because of changes in, in, uh, in uh, precipitation feedbacks, et cetera, et cetera. And you have a rainforest die off and that's going to have an effect on the climate, which in its in its turn is going to affect some of these other climate tipping points or, you know, cryosphere tipping points. What happens if the Greenland ice sheet collapses? How does it affect some of these other Earth system tipping points? So again, we're in really, really uncertain times here. Um, and the evidence for these climate tipping points is just growing and growing. You know, 15, 20 years ago, the IPCC would say this is like science fiction. Now they're taking it very, very seriously. And it's part of all the kind of, you know, standard um, reports, right? Um, I'm just seeing, I'm, I'm running out of sort of, I've got like five, six minutes, always since I can go for 25 minutes, so I might push it a bit more, but I'll jump some of these things and just go into the second part of my, uh, of, of the talk, which is, you know, um, okay, so it's a lot of doom and gloom. It's easy, you know, for us researchers working in like um, earth system, Anthropocene, great acceleration, um, sustainability science stuff, it's easy to get really, really depressed. Um, but the question always comes back to, you know, do we just give up hope? I think no. Um, you know, can we reach a fabulous Anthropocene era? Unlikely, but it's not impossible. That's, that would be my answer. Um, and I've been part of a project that really tackles this, this question head on. You know, a bunch of us that 10 years ago were getting increasingly frustrated about the doom and gloom surrounding our meetings, our workshops and everything. So we said, come on, there has to be something we can really do about it, mobilize. Um, you know, how can we start conceptualizing and thinking the safe and just space for humanity that doesn't break the environmental ceiling, the kind of the planetary boundaries, but still provides a social foundation, which is, you know, it's, it's decent, provides decent living for humanity on earth. This is from um, Kate Rowell. She's, she's a great economist. She's, she's published, you probably heard the book Donut Economics, which is just fantastic. And the link here is for one of her MOOC um, seminars that she gave for, uh, for one of the courses we ran at the SRC about five or six years ago. So catch, catch that talk. Um, and so we, we got together and said, there must be a lot of great initiatives that are happening around the world um, that are actually potentially contributing to a good Anthropocene. So we want to start collecting these initiatives. We published this paper as a kind of a placeholder, introducing the project. It got a lot of publicity, much more than we thought. So I think we tapped into a lot of researchers and policymakers kind of um, similar kind of tiredness of dystopia and kind of uh, um, desire for trying to do something that could lead to something better. Um, so basically we just started, let's just collect these initiatives in a database and let's start using them to start exploring, you know, what, what different visions of, of a better Anthropocene could look like. 
So, you know, we started collecting seeds and what we meant by seeds of a good Anthropocene, you know, it's, it's a way of thinking, doing a piece of technology and institution that exists. So it can't be a figment of someone's imagination. But this thing has to be at the margins of things. It can't be dominant or mainstream. And according to someone, it needs to contribute to creating a sustainable future. We kept it very simple. And very quickly, we had like 600 of these things and an ever-growing database. And this is just kind of mutated in many multiple ways. And I'm very happy to speak to it for a very long time later on, if anyone's interested. But at the core of this, you know, seeds of a good anthropocene isn't just kind of like fuzzy, wishful thinking, but a lot of kind of rigorous theory and empiry from social transition work, social ecological transformation work, social movement theory um, that basically, you know, says that change, big transformation in society always happen as an interaction between the big scale and the small scale. Um, but often, we often think about, let's just leave it to the big scale thing. Let's just leave it to governments, to big businesses and things like that to enact change. But actually, it often comes, you know, as, as, a, as a passing game between things happening on the micro level. So we see these seeds um, as small, you know, isolated small scale experiments. But what theory tells us is that these seeds start, you know, working with one another, you start collaborating with one another, you know, and start building new narratives, new visions. Um, and all of a sudden, they start affecting the different levels above them. And in some cases, they can lead to big transformation, they can actually change the macro structure, and the values of the old regime into something better. Um, so it's, you know, based on that theory, and that theory of change that we moved forward with the seeds of a good Anthropocene project. And, you know, we've, we've used it in many different ways. One branch of the project is actually, you know, collecting these seeds and analyzing them and saying, what's their common features and how can they contribute to big scale change. So one project um, by one of my postdocs took up some of the seeds we've collected from Africa, from the African continent, and actually looked at how they potentially contribute to the sustainable development goals. Oh, these things are just jumping ahead all the time without me touching it. Um, and what we found is that, you know, these local sustainability initiatives, they've been ignored by big policy in Africa, um, but they're actually doing a lot, a lot of on the ground work that is contributing to many of the goals and targets of the SDG. So the power of bottom up initiatives in moving us towards a sustainable future is quite immense. And here is just some evidence to back that up. We've also been using these seeds in participatory scenarios. So a lot of us are working with the IPCC and IPES and got frustrated with how they work with scenarios. Often it's very linear processes. You just do some biophysical modeling and say emissions change like this, and this is how the conditions of the world will change, which is great. But you know, social systems are much more complex. People react to change, new technologies pop up. There's a bunch of different social dynamics where you know they're not captured in these kind of IPCC and IPES scenarios. So we've used the seeds to generate new ways of doing scenarios. And actually now these are getting picked up by IPES, um, not so much by IPCC, although they've been kind of sniffing around and asking us a bit about it. But IPES is really interested. So they have a whole working group now trying to develop these kind of participatory scenarios for their future work, for nature's futures. And then more importantly, a lot of the work we do is in this kind of co-production and um, transdisciplinary space. And I think now going back to my final question, that's the kind of science I think we need to start looking for. So if we really want to enact and be part of sculpting and navigating towards a better Anthropocene as researchers. So these are some pictures from a workshop, a PhD of mine, Mie Selba, she's sitting there with a the yellow jacket, third from left in the bottom panel uh, picture with different seed um, uh, representatives in the Stockholm region. We're interested in how a food transformation could look like in, in Sweden and in the Stockholm, you know, the, the capital of Sweden and its kind of metropolitan area. So we got together a diverse set of actors from, you know, big representatives from the big kind of retail stores, the biggest giants in Sweden, to sh local chefs, to local farmers, um, et cetera, et cetera, and got them together and started discussing, you know, what can this future look like and, you know, ran a bunch of different participatory methods. But interestingly, this has led, you know, to a whole process that's been ongoing now for four or five years, which is quite a, you know, we weren't planning for it, but me has been caught up now in massive, you know, a change process working together with these actors. Um, she's actually, you know, um, managed to get some funding for herself. She's doing a very unorthodox postdoc where she spends half her time embedded with one of these kind of seeds in one of the municipalities outside of Stockholm, trying to kind of enact the change that we envisioned in this workshop. So really, really cool space. And I think this, is the kind of model, you know, I personally would 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 say is needed to to move towards 
us scientists helping and navigating towards a better um, Anthropocene, you know, the, the classical model is of science push, you know, researchers and information providers setting the agenda for what kind of science we do, right? Or, you know, you have this other model of demand pool that, you know, what new knowledge needs to be generated is set by, by decision makers outside of the scientific community. But this model of co-production where scientists and users work together to structure the whole process is something that's gaining more and more uh, popularity. It's actually becoming a mainstream way of doing it. And why it's better? Um, well, some of the benefits is that it actually increases inclusiveness and enrichment. You get a, a better nuance of the picture of the problem um, by involving more actors. You know, the, the results you get from the process are more legitimate if you actually include other stakeholders and scientists in the process. And the impact you might get from the science you do increases as you move into the knowledge co-production sphere. So I would say the past decade, thankfully, is, is a decade where knowledge co-production became mainstream. If you look at you know, the sustainable development strategy of Switzerland and Germany and a bunch of other countries, they include knowledge co-production at the core of this. Um, the U.S. National Global Change Research Plan also has knowledge co-production. Big research networks like Future Earth are also kind of throwing in knowledge co-production at the center, really realizing that, you know, science needs to get out of its ivory tower um, in order to, to be part of a change process, right? And so um, a bunch of colleagues, were actually 36 of us, you know, were, uh, you know, interested in this domain, but getting a bit frustrated as to you know, this this notion of knowledge co-production being thrown around, but there wasn't any kind of distinct principles of high quality knowledge co-production behind it. So we, we wrote a perspective piece that's also getting a lot, of, a lot of exposure. We kind of narrowed down to kind of four key principles. What do we need to do in order to start doing this knowledge co-production? The first one is if you're starting a, a knowledge production process, you need to situate it in a specific place or issue. So you need to be sensitive as to what's created a specific problem in the first place, what kind of legal, social, environmental barriers could be there that could stop any, any given solution you might come up with. The second principle is the more the better, right? So, so it has to be a pluralistic process. It, you really need a scientist to explicitly recognize that there's multiple ways of knowing and doing. And of course, this needs to be done with some kind of quality control, but there's ways of doing that. Um, and as you get in more perspectives, you get, get a much better sense of what the, the possible solution could be to any given problem. Um, and the, the other two principles, I'll go through them really, really quickly. I would say, you know, it, it, there needs to be a, a common goal set up from the beginning that needs to be clearly defined with, by all the stakeholders. And this goal needs to be interactively revisited. So it's an interactive and iterative process of constantly changing your goals. I won't go into too much detail, um, but you can read the paper and hopefully get inspired. The one thing that was challenging us, this is my final slide, is that a lot of knowledge co-production or transdisciplinary research or participatory research, and these are, these are things that have been happening for 50 years. I mean, we're not the first ones to come up with knowledge co-production. The point of the paper we wrote being is that these things are now becoming mainstream. But a lot of these kind of types of research have been happening with very local and regional communities. So it's either with fisher folk or farmers in small cities or small regions of the world. But, you know, we spoke about it before, the Anthropocene is hyper-connected. It's fast, it's turbulent. How can we have knowledge co-production um, that matches the dynamics in the Anthropocene? And it's extremely challenging. But one really good example of where that's happening is from this creation of the CBOS initiative, which is a seafood business for ocean stewardship. And I've, I've written down the two papers behind that kind of explain the science behind it. Basically, Henrik is a good friend and a colleague of mine. He sat on a map, you know, who were the big keystone actors? And this is the big fishing companies that are having uh, in a, an, ex an extremely high uh, effect on fishing effort in the global oceans, just to map them out to know who these actors are. And they published a paper in 2015 and came up with the 10 main companies. They were like, you know, exponentially responsible for, uh, for fishing, you know, cleaning up the oceans, basically. Um, and so the, the traditional science way of doing that would be to kind of blacklist those, those companies. But Henrik's idea was, how about we try and show them the results and get them speaking to us and see if we can enact change together. And it took him three years of constant traveling, Tokyo to Norway, Oyston, I mean, Norway, there's two representatives from Norway being Norwegian companies, Japanese companies, of course, some Korean and some US. Um, 
you know, and getting the cold shoulder, the cold hand constantly, because they thought, you know, what the hell are you? You know, we, we're very, we don't speak to scientists. We don't speak to NGOs. You're just after blacklisters. But after three years, they kind of started getting interested. And that's not because, you know, they were, they were saying no, not because they were stupid, but they actually are aware of the problems and that they're aware that, that they're part of the problems. Um, and actually, it became clear that they wanted to do something about it. So when they kind of built trust with Henrik, they sat down and had a series of meetings where they got shown the, the data, they got shown the science, they got you know, clear evidence that they're having a huge impact. Um, and they agreed on you know, starting a, a co-production process of trying to you know, navigate towards sustainability where you, know, you have scientists, a collaboration with these scientists and these big leading seafood companies across the whole sector of, of fishing to try and do something, do something better. So it's a great experiment of, I would say, you know, knowledge co-production and action science in the Anthropocene. And I'll leave it at that. And hopefully I've given you a bit of a kind of a flavor of, you know, this is what the Anthropocene is, but also that it's not all just, you know, doom and gloom. There's multiple ways of us as scientists of navigating through this mess and doing something without losing our scientific integrity, right? Because that's, that's always important as well, you know, um, and sorry, Oyston and Jonathan for butting into your time. Um, we can cut down on the question time for me then. Thank you, Albert, for a very, uh, very uh, interesting and uh, illuminating presentation. Um, I really liked how you were able to come up with these five words that describe the um, great acceleration, novel, um, and um, accelerated unequal, hyper-connected and turbulent. Boy, that really sets it apart. And then the focus on, the, on, on, on a uh, good Anthropocene. We need that discussion because we're going to lose people if all we do is talk doom and gloom. So you really are uh, on cutting edge with your work. Uh, I asked, um, the first person actually I emailed at the uh, Stockholm Resilience Center was Jonathan Dungus. And, um, he, but I got in touch with him later. And I, he uh, and I have corresponded and I, I thought if he could give from a perspective of his discipline, how he has engaged this topic of the great acceleration and issues of agency. And having read some of your stuff, um, Jonathan, I know you're into, into agency, so we'll turn the time over to you. Uh, he is at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research and the Stockholm Research uh, Resilience Center. Jonathan, your, your uh, time and we can share screen again, yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so I'm on. Let's see if... We can see you. Yes, perfect. Uh, but you're, you're probably on... Which, do you see the, the, con the monitor slide? We I see the title slide with the, um, yes, with the... Uh, two, uh, with the next slide, right? No. It always we, does that. Or do you see the big, do you see the, the big, big slide? slide? Yeah, okay, yeah. so thank you. Okay, good. Yeah. So, so yeah, let me, um, it sometimes does that. It makes, messes it up usually, you know? Okay, so I'm, I, I'm gonna jump straight in and, and thanks for Einstein, or Einstein and Albert for setting the stage. So I can really, I really wanna, wanna start like uh, Einstein asked me to do it to, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna say a few words about my disciplinary back, background and, and then show how I got involved, you know, how I got interested in, in the question of the great acceleration and the Anthropocene and then, um, you know, highlight some recent work that we've done um, and, and kind of finish with a perspective on, on this, this overall work. So my, my background is really in theoretical physics and complex system science. This is um, the field uh, where I did my, in which I did my PhD, um, but I was already at that point uh, applying the methods I developed to earth system science. Um, so I'm, I don't have a classic, uh, say, climate modeling background, but rather complex systems and complex network uh, analysis background. And this is kind of why I show you this picture. This is one of the results of my PhD thesis where I studied um, circulation systems um, on the globe using complex network theory. If I critical bottlenecks and um, critical points for where, where disturbances could propagate um, 
in, uh, in, in an easy way. You know, it's kind of already a very, you could see it as an approach of, of looking at the weak spots of the Earth system in terms of human perturbations. And um, I, I did this, you know, using methods from, from, from um, as I said, uh, complex system theory, but this involves really networks, this involves uh, statistics, machine learning, and also um, modeling. But as you will see, um, networks are, are kind of, have been and are still a key um, part of my work. So, uh, and it is actually uh, via, via this network perspective, you could say that I got more and more interested in um, social ecological systems as well and uh, social ecological perspective on, on the um, Anthropocene and on gl um, global warming climate change, et cetera. So it is one, these types of pictures, which, uh, which, which have a clear network uh, perspective, of course, in it. This is the uh, similar picture to what Albert showed before. So it's the tra uh, transportation networks connecting um, human societies across the globe. And it's, of course, these networks, um, in addition to the networks of resource extraction, energy, transport, et cetera, that are driving the great acceleration and the ecological climatic uh, damages that uh, are happening to the earth system because of that at the moment. So um, when I, um, one, one approach that, um, that then brought me closer to the great acceleration was um, just to, to show you uh, something concrete here is a time series analysis work that we did. So applying methods from here, complex system theory, multivariate statistics to these great acceleration graphs that, that were shown before already. So we're really basing this on the, uh, on the earth system trends and the socioeconomic trends data from the Stefan et al. 2015 paper that were shown before. And we did um, breakpoint detection uh, analysis here. So we were basically, we wanted to know when, when when did this great acceleration really uh, happen uh, kind of in the most pronounced way? And usually it's, it says it's around 1950. This is also what, what uh, the results show here, but you can, you can look into this a bit more closely. And interestingly, for example, we found here that there is also breakpoints, um, uh, kind of a, you know, um, uh, clustering of breakpoints of, of, of change points in these great acceleration graphs also earlier here, for example, in the 19th century, but also, um, for example, if you distinguish this by socioeconomic and natural earth system trends, you see that uh, the socioeconomic great acceleration, to, so to say, starts a bit earlier than the natural earth system, one which, of course, makes sense given the causality. But uh, you can also look at it in terms of that's on the right, um, lower right hand side, in terms of socioeconomic indicators, if you distinguish it uh, between OECD. Uh, BRICS countries and others, so countries of different socioeconomic development, uh, you can also see that um, it started earlier in the OECD countries. Um, and, and, and this is just one, one perspective of how one can look into these data and this, uh, the great acceleration in a, uh, from the perspective of data science. Now, um, I, I became more and more interested in uh, actually more uh, kind of a process-based um, um, modeling, a systemic perspective on why, why has the Great Acceleration actually developed as it has and has brought us to the point uh, of, of um, dangerous global warming, uh, you know, biosphere destruction, et cetera, that we are at at the moment. And um, I mean, what, what, what becomes clear is that from the perspective of Earth system science, um, we, we have to kind of, um, we have to go beyond the paradigm that has driven Earth system science for the past decades, which is this present diagram perspective, which almost entirely focuses on the physical climate system and the biogeochemical cycles. Um, um, but we have to move more to a uh, updated perspective um, of, of the Earth system, which equally um, takes into account human and uh, natural Earth system components and, and uh, their, their interactions to really understand the underlying um, processes that drive the great acceleration. And that also, of course, and I get to that more towards the end of the talk, um, of course, importantly, um, this understanding is, is needed to, to identify how we can get ourselves out of that situation and get to more towards a, a good Anthropocene futures that Albert has, has talked about kind of from this Earth system perspective here. And um, what we, 
but kind of this is really what has been driving my work for the past years is really this um, striving for development of new what we call world earth system models that that can study that can kind of put this uh, this this updated perspective of of the human earth system into um, into actual scientific tools analyses and results so kind of turning this conceptual picture um, into into actual uh, models and analyses that we can do and um, this is something we're doing here for example in the dominoes project um, interacting tipping points as Albert has also uh, highlighted our key feature of our work here so also interacting tipping uh, points between the natural uh, climate system and and social systems and um, this is really uh, involves a lot of processes which are not at all um, represented in current models of global change and importantly um, these are um, social network dynamics for example opinion formation policy processes social tipping points or again tipping interactions and we've done this um, in a kind of systematic assessment we've, we've developed a framework uh, for for classifying different processes uh, that play uh, a key role uh, of driving um, earth system dynamics in the Anthropocene on these uh, three different levels, um, socio-cultural, socio-metabolic and biophysical. And um, this framework helps us to, uh, to, to kind of um, to, to sort out what models we need for describing the great acceleration and uh, uh, potential ways of, of getting out of it. Um, we've built a um, a uh, framework, a modeling, an actual modeling um, a platform to, to construct these models using, uh, importantly, um, uh, agent-based models to, uh, to represent human agency on different levels. So it can be on the individual level, but also on the level of groups, um, organizations, institutions. Um, and um, coupling this, allowing to couple this to the more macro uh, dynamics of social systems, such as let's say cities or nation states, eco economies, and to the biophysical dynamics that are happening more on the grid cell level, but of course also on different scales. And this is a framework that we're using now for, um, for, for a lot of our modeling projects. And um, now to get a bit more into the, the question of, um, of agency in, in uh, what has driven the great acceleration and what could get us out of it. Um, let, me, let me show one of those paleoclimate graphs again, also kind of um, uh, that, that Albert already, um, he, he kind of showed this briefly too, but I think it's kind of startling again uh, to see the great acceleration here in, in the climate space. So this is, this is in, in terms of global warming. Um, we have <clears throat> in the, um, uh, last decades, we have seen already a very uh, fast and, and strong global warming compared to what has happened during the past uh, 20,000 years since the last glaciation. So about um, in the past 100 years, we've seen about one degree of global warming uh, at a, a rate which is about 100 times faster than the warming that took place after the last glacier maximum to the beginning of the Holocene, which is, so it's a great acceleration really truly um, also in the rate of change, not only in the magnitude of the change. And what we can see here is that in the future uh, climate scenarios that are projected by the IPCC, this, uh, this, this trend would continue even to, yeah, to, to unimaginable uh, levels. Um, for example, with the RCP 8.5 scenario, um, eight degrees of warming by, 2000, by the year 2500, which is of course, I mean, one, one should say, um, importantly, this is not considered really as a business as usual scenario anymore or has never really been. So it's more, um, currently we are more likely to land at the RCP 4.5 or RCP 6 um, scenario if uh, kind of transformative change does not happen, which is still a huge um, change out of the Holocene, of course. Now, the um, uh, a major research project that Ilona Otto and I have, have pursued over the past uh, years is that has been published last year in PNAS is uh, this question of what, what, uh, are the, what are processes, what are social tipping dynamics that could potentially inverse this trend and get us um, uh, kind of um, help to reach the Paris climate targets. A huge um, reduction of emissions is needed to reach these targets, even larger 
I mean, larger than uh, what, what has happened during major crises in the past, the Second World War, the collapse of communism, but importantly, also larger than uh, the reductions we've seen uh, 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic, which are already much larger than, um, or, yeah, considerably larger, actually, than what has happened during the Second World War, uh, interestingly, if you look into the data. So now, what, what is this concept of social tipping points? Um, it's really... Um, the kind of taking complex systems perspective uh, again on on multi stable uh, systems or multi uh, uh, pass bifurcations of systems that um, so we the system needs to go from a business as usual, usual state with a locked in great acceleration um, of emissions uh, and, and this needs to be economic growth and uh, social development needs to be decoupled from uh, from emissions and environmental impacts and um, these lock ins uh, kind of um, getting rid of these lock-ins uh, can be can be conceptualized as uh, as um, getting rid of this ridge here of the of the hill in this energy landscape. So that's again kind of going back to physics. If you see this as an energy landscape, a system wants to go from a high energy state um, to a low energy state, and um, this um, so this hill needs to go away. And this is what the social tipping interventions are about that we've worked on and we've done a large, uh, actually a qualitative expert elicitation involving uh, more than uh, 100, um, 100 international experts. And um, they have identified their five or six major areas that we call social tipping elements where um, their decarbonization can be uh, triggered um, on different scales. And um, they've also helped us to identify social tipping interventions that um, can then actually are actual um, points in these um, in these different social systems where policymakers or social movements or other actors uh, can um, can 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 potentially uh, trigger change. So basically, points uh, in the social structure where where you could say that agency uh, is concentrated or could be concentrated to affect change and to to drive the system away from its um, harmful great acceleration uh, trajectory and. In, in examples, I think just to mention maybe three, uh, of course, financial markets and the divestment movement, information feedback, so greenhouse gas information disclosure, uh, education, climate education, but also the norms and value system um, are, are important here. And the um, now a lot of my work currently is about understanding these different social tipping points and dynamics uh, in more detail using Again, methods from uh, you know this world Earth system modeling, complex system science, and network theory, and um, the um, one one very important concept that uh, that uh, I think is I should mention more towards the end now is kind of my this is my the it's not not the last slide but uh, nearly uh, it's the technosphere. So this is really a concept of coupled social, cultural, technological systems that um, that uh, is um, is this is the coupled system that that has driven the great acceleration in the past, and we think that um, a, a network, multi-level adaptive network perspective on on the system can really uh, bring us um, a big deal forward in understanding uh, first the historical dynamics of the great acceleration much better. So we have to move kind of from these very simple pictures on the top left to a more uh, kind of more adequate, more modern picture um, here on the bottom right, and um, this is this is kind of this is future work that's um, ongoing more on the conceptual level and overall this is then uh, what what I see as a whole earth system analysis really um, my my research field that I'm I'm, I'm kind of working in um, complex systems analysis combined with a uh, in-depth study of human earth system interactions and only that can help us to get a little bit of of an idea of how this complex landscape of uh, future trajectories in environmental and social dimensions looks like. And this is kind of also bringing, of course, we would like to go to the safe and just operating space, the Oxfam donut, but there are also dangerous catastrophic domains that, domains that need to be avoided. And there are also other trajectories. And um, I think only this integrated systems perspective can, can, um, can help to, uh, to shed some light here, kind of all starting from the idea of the great acceleration and the Anthropocene, but, but kind of combining this with complex systems and earth system science. So um, all uh, 
very, very broad and more conceptual ideas this time, not so concrete, sorry about that. So I, uh, there's a number of papers uh, that, that uh, get, shed a bit more light on this, I hope, and uh, thanks a lot. Um, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, this uh, is a w great window on how your discipline is contributing to understanding the macro picture. I was wondering, you know, uh, Albert talked about seed projects and one of his students who's actually having great success by starting at the bottom. And I, if, if, if where in your, if you don't mind putting your slides back up, where would you see a seed project in your uh, graphic of the interactions that need to happen? I'm just curious if you could place your seed uh, 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 that, and Albert, you might uh, touch, ha have an idea about that as well. So where, something really grassroots, where would that be depicted in your model? You mean that, that one? Yes, I mean, yeah, you, yeah. You, yes, I think that's probably your best summary of these interactions and the agency aspect of it. Yeah. So, so where is the sort of grassroots seed project depicted here in this system, would you say, or is it not? I mean, is it education maybe? Or, well, of course, it touches on all of these things, doesn't it? And it, should, should I say something about it and then Albert or? Uh, yes, yeah, I can. I can jump in. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it's, I was, I'm, I love this, this one. I remember reading the paper, Jonathan, and really finding it fascinating. It, because I would say, I mean, the seeds that we've been collecting actually fit in every, in all of these different uh, potential social tipping elements. That's a cool thing. Like, like I said, when we're collecting these seeds, we're not giving any value judgments that they have to be, they have to be that green agroecology. You know, they can be any initiative, and that people think can can contribute to, uh, to good Anthropocene. And then we're analyzing them to get these a set of like, what are their common features? And we have a very detailed set of criteria assessment, which builds on, on theory of transformation and resilience, et cetera, et cetera. But some of the seeds are education system. They're small scale experiments in trying to change education systems all over the world. Some of the seeds are, you know, um, information feedbacks. It's like blockchain, yeah. technology, blah, 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 all, all over the world. Um, some of the seeds are around, you know, new ways of doing local economies, financial market restructuring, for example. Yeah. Human settlements, for sure. There's a lot of the seeds which are all about, you know, changing yeah. the way people produce foods in their communities, et cetera, et cetera. So I would say the seeds database actually has things across all of these different social tipping elements. Um, so in, in one sense, we're trying to do what Jonathan is doing, but from different angles, basically this is like enriching these bloody models that people and decision makers that, you know, use and models can be powerful things and global environmental assessments are powerful things, but they use quite linear models. It's like, you know, yes. um, Jonathan said, so I think both of our projects are actually just different ways of trying to enrich them with the complexities of social ecological systems in different ways, right? Yeah, very good. Yes, uh, Jonathan, did you want to comment on my question too? Yes, I mean, uh, what, what I could uh, add to, to what Albert said, I, I think is one, um, one case, uh, case that, that we've, we, are, we are looking at in a, in, a, in a current, in a paper that is um, in the archive. So it's a preprint paper that is currently under review uh, where we are kind of expanding this, this perspective on social tipping elements uh, more. We, we are looking at the case of the uh, climate movement of, of the past two, three years, the, the, namely the Fridays for Future movement, which was very prominent, of course, driven by, by Greta Thunberg, also Nordic explorer in some sense, right, like from Sweden. Yeah. And uh, that was very prominent in Europe and, and, and uh, all, particularly in Germany was very large. I mean, this, this is kind of what I observed most directly. And this is clearly um, one, one seed, one, one, one driver in, in, the, in this uh, STE4 uh, cluster that we have identified, the norms and value system, um, because they, this movement was revealing very strongly, was po pointing out the moral implications of using fossil fuels. This is something that uh, Greta Thunberg has highlighted very strongly in her addresses also to the United Nations, etc. right? That she said, uh, be ashamed to, uh, to ruin our future, basically, you should be ashamed. And, um, and this is, I think, one very interesting uh, point where it's, it's kind of one, one of those, uh, 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 you know, um, seeds that, that is usually not really considered in the standard uh, uh, IPCC type assessments where it's about, oh, we need to improve energy efficiency and we have to 
uh, we kind of have to reduce the coal power plants, you know, and this is kind of, this is a completely different angle. And this is why I find it quite fascinating because it has had a lot of impact. I mean, uh, you could argue whether it has had an actual impact yet on, on the economy and, and the energy system, but it has clearly have, it has driven the politics um, uh, quite, uh, at least here in Europe, I think, and, and at least in Germany, what I can observe most directly, it has kind of, they have really made the politicians um, yeah, at least talk about it again, right? The topic. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah. uh, what, I, what I also really like about both of these presentations is that they're highly um, systematic and science-based, but there's a definite at, uh, effort to engage policymaking and culture. And uh, that's what I'm going to take away as well. Uh, as an anthropologist, I mean, or in the humanities, there's a tradition of kind of an ivory tower, isolated, we just study, particularly where I work, you know, if you're studying archaeology, you study Roman archaeology, or you mm. study Islamic archaeology, but you don't look at the big picture. So I'm kind of a, I'm breaking out of that mold, trying to look at the region through time. And so there's a new name for that, it's called global history, mm. or big history. And it's in global history and big history that we are engaging people like you. And, and beginning to factor in the environment in a whole new way to discourses that otherwise were totally as if there was no environment, if it always stayed the same. It obviously didn't. Well, it's time for others to speak up and to speak, uh, to ask questions. Or remember what our goal with this uh, conversation is to kind of uh, seed ideas of how uh, Haneke and um, Enut might want to engage, or uh, Christophs or myself, with this concept of the Great Acceleration as uh, explorers, and, and Tara too, how we could engage uh, through our particular discipline. W would it be okay if I ask each of you briefly to say a word about where you come from again, disciplinarily? Hanek, you to start with you, Meyer. Yeah, of course. Um, well, as you, uh, Einstein, I also work with faunal analysis. Oh, do you? Uh, yes, I do. Although my my period tends to be a bit further back in time. Yeah. Um, uh, but I'm mostly working with bird remains, but I, I am also looking at other material. Um, a lot of my research has been done in Southeast Asia, yeah. in Indonesia, and there particularly, I've been working there more than 10 years now, and you see a definite change happening there. You see a quickening of pace of people having um, mobile phones, of the impact of uh, online technology on people, on youth particularly. Uh, and that is something that we're trying to use to our advantage by including when we are doing research in the field, we're doing excavations in the field and we're trying to include youth by including these elements in our outreach. But it's um, yeah, it's something that is still challenging, but, um, and of course, we also see an impact of tourism there, yeah. definitely on some of the, the smaller um, islands that I'm working on is, when I just started working there, tourism was, very, tourism was very limited, and now we see, especially the last couple of years, we see a huge increase in, in tourism, even in the more remote areas, and that is, that is worrying to me, because yeah. it, of, of course, it provides an income for, for a lot of people, but at the same time, it isn't controlled enough to limit its negative impact. See, when I am now trying, I'm developing a online tour of the site of Hespan, which is behind me. And I want to make the major story about Hespan, not just primarily the tribal kingdoms and these urbanizations and the Islamic. I want to really talk about, use the site as a place to talk about the human footprint on mm. the environment. Yeah. And in the process, I will talk about the Romans and what they did and what the Muslims did and what the Great Acceleration has done. But it, it provides a, a new frame for narrating our sites that speaks to the present of the population that lives there today. And I've already begun doing this and found it makes a huge difference because they can relate to water issues and they're interested in what the ancient, Rome, uh, the ancient um, Ammonites did. Well, let's hear from um, uh, in Enot. Uh, what is your uh, yeah. discipline and Hi. how uh, does this uh, interest you? 
Well, first of all, I would like to say thank you for your talks because it was really interesting. Um, actually, for me, I study glaciers. Um, glaciers. Oh boy. Glaciers, yeah. yeah. So I have. We lost you. With glaciers in Patagonia. So basically, we are seeing the great oscillation in glacier retreat since the 1980s more or less uh, in both areas and then we know that the major systems like Greenland and Antarctica are going to face uh, in the next century maybe the tipping points so that's why I will say that for me the social part is not really well understood but these talks were really clear for that so thanks for it um, yeah basically I usually also give uh, some science, science communication lectures in, in the, for kids and for high school in Spanish and Basque. And that's why I like to join climate change, glaciers or cryosphere change and, and the great acceleration of the Anthropocene, for example. Yeah, very good. Of course, you have to hurry up if you're going to study glaciers. <laughs> because yeah, definitely. They definitely. Are, they are Actually, really oh. heading uh, south. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's it. I mean, for example, in Europe, the, the southernmost glaciers that we have in Europe are located in the Pyrenees. I know. Um, I know. Yeah, go ahead. As a child, I used to go with Bergenspan and from Oslo across to Bergen, you know. This is a beautiful train ride. And you, you, in the, you used to see enormous glaciers. Now you can hardly see them at all. They come, they're, they're disappearing. Well, so uh, you surely have a, a very powerful window on the great acceleration in your line of research. Uh, what about Terra, Kier? Uh, where, where you, uh, what is your disciplinary background and how does this topic uh, pertain to you? Hi, everyone. Sorry, my, my video is not working today, but um, I'm based in DC and my background is uh, wildlife conservation, specifically looking into uh, the poaching crisis in South Africa and the socioeconomic drivers behind it. Um, but this just, you know, anything related to wildlife, I think ties perfectly into the Anthropocene and, and trying to figure out, you know, this coexistence of, of humans as a part of the ecosystem and understanding our role in it and the devastating impacts we have is critical. And I spend so much time um, in the world of wildlife crime and this particularly poaching of rhino in South Africa, looking into the human side of the story. Um, so we can really analyze, you know, the why behind people are involving themselves to kill wildlife in the first place and making sure that we're understanding those complex factors behind it in order to be able to proceed with um, creating viable solutions. So, um, you know, this, this all in all has been really fascinating to hear and, you know, it's really, really urgent. And um, thank you so much for sharing. I, I've really appreciated it. You know, uh, thank you, Tara. Uh, your field is sort of this is similar to Christop's area, also studying, he's an ornithologist, right? And looking at uh, genetic uh, related issues in, in that realm, and also the issue of uh, extinctions, I know operates in both of your fields, doesn't it? Well, what I was wondering, uh, we, we are trying to also think about as a Nordic hub, but I mean now as the as members of this uh, group of uh, explorers, what might be some next steps? And, and one thing I came to mind as you were talking about seeds, um, I wonder if there's a way that we could connect up explorers in some of the same localities as some of the seeds are happening, because the seeds that you're talking about are little groups, as I understand it, that have got, they got it, they understand there's something needing to happen. And then if we, whether whatever our background is, could connect with one of those seeds, or we might also be startups for seeds in, in where we are. But the point is, is to maybe be able to provide some input where there is already something happening. So are you mapping or locating or publicizing these seeds in some way, Albert, or are they uh, still uh, confidential information? 
not so much confidential. I mean, the, the project, like I said, it, it, we, we began 10 years ago with a grant from the National Science Foundation, like a seed grant, um, aptly named the seed grant to start a seeds work. Um, we had a workshop and, and it's, it kind of involves eight different PIs initially, um, multiple institutions, and it's just grown so organically. Now this, you know, there's not a central steering committee of the seeds project. We have a database and that's being rehauled now. We finally got some grant money to focus on that just to kind of redo the database because it's been collected in many different projects. So information on the seeds have been collected in participatory workshops, in conferences, in online surveys, a bunch of different places all around the world. And there's slightly differences in how they've been collected. So we just need to kind of bring them all together. It's certainly not confidential, but we're not, the website is slightly old. We want to kind of revamp that. Um, and we just want to have a better sense of how we curate the seeds. But, but, but it, it's always open to connect us. So if anyone from you would be interested, I mean, there's still, you know, you can still um, submit a seed. There's an online tool to do that, or you can get in touch. Or if you want to be part of a one of the science spin-off projects, you can get in touch to, to some of us and we can, you know, put you, connect you with a, with a current batch of students, mm -hmm. PhDs, postdocs all over the world that are kind of digging into this a yeah. bit more, uh, a bit more deeply. I mean, we see this as a kind of a, a multi-headed Hydra project um, that should inspire. And if people want to take the ideas and methods, we're not, we don't have a copyright on it. It's free to kind of get inspired by it and just run with it, you know, as, as long as you just connect to us and give us a thanks or something like that. <laughs> well, uh, I wonder if I can put uh, Sophie or Christine on the spot. Uh, are there any observations you have from hearing these presentations today uh, and, uh, that link up with other things going on in the society or with other hubs. Uh, can you think of any connections? Christine, maybe? Sorry, my, my connection's a back deep, but um, I, I really liked hearing, Albert, about the knowledge co-production framework that you've been working on. I think it provides such a good foundation for a lot of things that both our local hubs and explorers more broadly looking to collaborate kind of questions that they have about like, where do we start? What do we want to make sure we have as components to have a successful collaboration? And like, what are the goals? And um, I, I thought that including the context is, is so important to like have that be connected to a particular place, an issue and like what it looks like in that space. And that's definitely like how we've been thinking about it in terms of localizing things and giving explorers access to each other in order to kind of create that pluralistic environment where something like that can, can flourish. And so I, th I thought that it was really neat the work that you've been doing around that and seeing how that connects too with like, you know, once you have that framework connect with one of the like social tipping point kind of categories that, um, that Jonathan, you spoke about and kind of looking at it in that way, it's, um, I think it lays it out quite clearly the way you've explained it and puts words to kind of a lot of amorphous things that I think people are questions that they have um, about like how how can we do this together and what should we focus on um, and just that understanding that it will look different at every place that you are and that the needs in your community and the resources that you have and the group that you have can really inform that so I think that was just um, a really helpful framework and just taking some screenshots of those because I think it'd be really help helpful to like reference for, for other hubs as well. So thank you for that. I, I think, you know, one of the biggest opportunities and, and ways to make a difference is if we can reach, if we can find a way for what uh, Albert and uh, Jonathan were talking about, but also our own research to reach the K through 12 education, you know, curricular kind of material that uh, boils it down. And you're, you've done it, both have material, but especially Albert, some of what you have is of course very uh, accessible. And um, I, I think that that's an opportunity as well that we have to, to consider. So um, we actually have come to the end of our time, but um, I've learned a great deal in this presentation and I really am thankful for the uh, 
preparation and what you presented both uh, Albert and Jonathan. And uh, I wonder, any thoughts about what next? I know that Christophs and I will talk some more and Christine and, and Sophie, but, uh, and by the way, uh, we'd like to have uh, Tara and um, Inot and um, Hane Haneke, are you, if you're willing, I think the next thing is that we want to meet again, probably as the Nordic Hub, or shall we meet as the Great Acceleration Collaboration, perhaps, because we are not all Nordic Hub, uh, to talk about uh, what next, because we don't have, we, we didn't expect to have time to do, to do that today. But why don't I ask Christophs that you get everybody's email that's here now, and we'll meet again. We need the time to think about what we've heard and, and, and talk about it. And then after we have a conversation, I think we should send a report back to Albert and Jonathan of what we've talked about. You'd be welcome to join us as well. So do include them, but I know they have other things they are going. But the idea, of course, of the hubs is to try to create some kind of a momentum uh, in a way that is uh, a win-win both for us as um, individual scholars, but also our communities in regards to this really timely topic. So that, that, that I think is my suggestion for a step forward. How does that sound to the rest of you explorers? Yes, Albert, you had your hand up? Okay. I'm just giving my thumbs up. Yeah. That we meet again, I, and then we talk about what uh, we have learned and how it might be possible for us personally in our own work and what we might do in uh, in co knowledge production as a team working uh, in cooperation also perhaps with the uh, National Geographic uh, Explorer uh, community. And do I also understand? Uh, that uh, this will be available for other explorers to listen to then? You recorded it? S Sophie, is that the case? Yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. So um, Chris Ops is going to send me the, the link and then um, um, if, you, if you want me to, I can post it on the Explorer, the Explorer community um, send a link to everyone to watch it. So uh, maybe the next step then is that uh, we prepare a brief abstract, Christoph and I, of what happened today. And then we could maybe include in our invitation others who are not here today, but who have listened to the streaming of the session, and they could come and join in a discussion about what happens next. So uh, that way, we the, there would be individuals that might have wanted to be here but couldn't hear it, but they can listen and then join us if they think it's relevant. Okay, well, thank you, and it's nice to see you back, Rebecca. How was your student? Did they deliver on what you had agreed? Yeah, yes, he was very grateful that um, I, I relieved some of his stress for the end of the Good. semester. Good. Well, we're glad that, that you were able to be part of it and uh, that you came back. We, we've had, a, a, I think you missed Jonathan, but he ha you'll be able to see his uh, presentation on the streaming. So thank you very much. Yes, by the way, question. Are we yes. technically over time? I, I thought I wanted to ask a few things. Okay, go ahead. I, I, is anyone in a hurry for something? I, I need to I need to log out now because I've got people's uh, yeah. and time. Sure. And so I, I think that, uh, if you need to go now, it's fine. But we can stay on a little bit longer, sure. Okay, so my main thing was that Many of us, like me, mostly we study nerdy small things and often don't see the. Thank you, Albert. Yeah, thank you, Albert. Okay. Oh yeah, well, Jonathan, you're the expert still here, and Rebecca works on the topic and so on. Anyway, we often specialize in narrow and small things. Like me, for example, I study these small birds up here, and then uh, there's sort of a snobism, also from my side sometimes, which is not really correct, but it creeps in. So we can be in two groups largely. People who study the big picture and look very snobically on the ones that study something very close up and nerdy. And both approaches are not perfect because when you very closely look at something under a microscope, you don't see how it fits in the bigger image. But if you zoom out too much, you see it too blurry and everything becomes very conceptualized, abstract, and means nothing in the end of the extreme end. So how could nerds like me, what should we do? make a more meaningful contribution to our output? Is that like adding a paragraph in the discussion, touching on these topics, or 
should we combine and submit all the findings in some centralized database? How to direct all this? It's a great question, and I'm sure you're not alone in having uh, that um, question about how, how does my research on a very, very focused um, mm. topic of ornithology relate. Um, and, you know, I, I think the academic system is targeting that kind of focus. And so the challenge we have is to, to, to take the time to have these kinds of conversations to see how we can reach out. And I mean, coming back to your field of ornithology, of course, uh, I guess the problem of extinctions is not so much an issue for you, but at the same time, uh, even the issue of, of genetics uh, uh, has a, um, a kind of a time trajectory, doesn't it? And it's, it's being impacted by changes in the environment, in climate. In fact, navigation of birds, I understand, is extremely related to uh, issues of climate and even changes in the North Pole and all kinds of things. Is that, is that part of what you do? Yeah, it's related to those keywords. Yeah, but I think we don't have that much time. Maybe we can leave this for the next follow-up seminar. I, think I would be interested in such a discussion as well, Crystal. Yeah. Hmm? Well, that's, I think, exactly the discussion we should have. Yeah. Because I think a lot of us work in very focused areas and uh, and yet we have a sense of wanting to be relevant. In fact, our disciplines require yeah. I think, that we can speak to the broader issues to keep getting funding and such yeah. uh, for our work. And Rebecca, yes, uh, there you are. Nice uh, again, yeah. What do you I'm here. Uh, so I work a, a great deal with geography educators. And oh. so having a specific small bird information um, entry point is excellent because people always like to be smarter, right? And an educator is is trying to figure out how to uh, capture students' attention and share this information. But if we can use the examples that you all, uh, as scientists, are creating, and yeah. then figure out a more uh, uh, and thinking of that as a way into the topic, yes. right? That's I, I think that's what I'm finding, uh, especially for myself, is interesting uh, in this discussion. Yeah. Christoph, you're going to schedule our next meeting, okay? Yeah, yeah. I guess we're going to discuss this afterward. Well, thank you, everyone, for your time. You know, time is the only thing that you will never, ever get back. So <laughs> very much appreciated. Very much so. Thank, thank you for setting this up. And thank you for joining us. And uh, Christine and Sophie for... Uh, uh, holding the National Geographic uh, flag up there for us. Appreciate that. Thanks for inviting us. <laughs> okay, we'll see you all. Thanks so much. Take care, everyone. Thank bye -bye. you.